Next from Springfield, the Central Illinois Innocence Project shows how wrongful convictions can happen even when there is overwhelming evidence of innocence. We'll hear from David Cam, a former Indiana state trooper who was himself the victim of shoddy police work and overly aggressive prosecutors, who tried him three times for the murders of his wife and children despite obvious evidence and witnesses that proved he was not at the scene of the crime. This runs about 55 minutes. I'm gonna need these. I've told this story a few times. It never gets any easier. We're from an area of southern Indiana near Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville metro area, they refer to it as, or Kentuckiana. Um, in that area of uh, the state, northern Kentucky, when people hear my name, they have all sorts of reactions and uh, probably have all sorts of description as to who they believe that I am. A lot of times what you would hear on, on TV and in the media is former Indiana State Trooper David Cam. I think they do that to get people to tune in to see what's going on next and why is this state trooper in the news and so on. So, And I was a, an Indiana State Trooper for about ten and a half years. Left the department in the spring of 2000. My family owns a fairly successful foundation stabilization company. We do basement waterproofing. They had came to me and offered me a position within the company, and at that point in time, I felt like, you know, about 36 years old, maybe it's time to make a change in my life, go a different direction. And I ultimately would beginning, begin working for the family business. Lots of things going on in our lives with Kim and the kids. <coughs> New direction. Was still friends with a lot of the ISP guys. Considered them family. <coughs> as I said before, a lot of people have different reactions as to who I am. Well, the thing that they forget is that was the husband of Kim. <laughs> Father to Brad, seven years old. Daddy to Jill, five. September 28, 2000. It's a normal morning. Get up, get ready to go to work. My day was well, well planned out ahead of time. Last thing I do is hug and kiss Kim and the kids goodbye, get in my truck, and go to work. As I said, it's a normal day, very routine. That evening, I and a group of other individuals from our church have been playing basketball every Thursday. Church members and it's pickup ball. I know I'm in Big Ten country, so you guys understand basketball fairly well. Pickup ball. And we would get together every Thursday and play ball at our gymnasium at our church. <clears throat> that was my plan for that day. And that's in fact what I did. Kim takes the kids, takes them to school, preschool, drops them off. She goes to work. Kim's an accountant. <laughs> She's graduated from Indiana University. Uh, works for a large corporation in Louisville. Very busy, successful woman. And a great wife. We normally play ball till about 9 o'clock in the evening. For some reason that evening we decided to play over. Left the gym about 9.22, I think, is when we set the alarm. It's about a five-minute drive. 
as I drove home, I was thinking, I'm going to be late. Kim's going to be upset. She's having to do baths and homework and all of those things. Be associated with kids at that age, getting them ready for bed. And I'm probably going to hear about that when I get home. That's what I was thinking. They pulled into my driveway. We lived on a private road. It's named after my grandfather, who at that time still lived on the road. Pull up to my drive, up, up my drive, it's, it's on an incline. Pulling up to the garage, and my truck was a clutch. And I can so vividly remember as I approached the door, kind of doing the gas and the clutch back and forth after I had hit the button to raise the door, waiting to go in. The door's going up. At some point in time, the garage door raises high enough to get above the hood of my truck. It's a millisecond. And in that millisecond, everything that I knew about life and the world changed. Kim was lying on the garage floor, pool of blood, long clear stream leading away from the pool of blood toward the driveway. Check on Kim. I'd been a trooper for 10 years. I've seen a lot of death. It's pretty obvious that she was gone. Start thinking about the kids. Passenger doors open on the Bronco. Looked inside the Bronco, I didn't see anything. Got up into the Bronco, looked a little closer. Saw Brad first. He's on the driver's side in the back passenger compartment draped over the back seat. Turned to my left. Jill still sitting in her seat. Still got her seat belt on. Her little head's down her lap. Her hair was flowing down over. I couldn't see her face. I had to do something, right? I don't know who I was in that moment. Am I a father? Am I the police officer? Your mind's going a million different directions, but I knew that I had to do something. Got in the back seat and I grabbed Brad. Laid him on the garage floor next to his mom. Start giving my seven year old son CPR. A little overwhelming. Goes on for a few minutes. It's not good. At some point, you have to call for help. What do you do? Ran out of the house, got on the phone, called the state police. It's my family. Those were my friends. People that I loved, I knew that I could count on. I called them. I'm screaming. I need help. <clears throat> As I said before, my grandfather lived on that private road and lived directly across from me. My uncle was staying with him that evening. He was elderly. Someone was always with him. So it happened that evening that the uncle that was staying there with him was also a 30-year retired police officer. Ten years with Kentucky State Police, or retired from Louisville. Ran over, burst in the house. Nelson, I need help. We go back over to the garage. Nelson reevaluates Kim, Brad, and Jill. They're gone. He tells me at that point, Davis is a crime scene. We said we wait on the police to get there.
They eventually began to arrive. A lot of them I knew had known well. I'd worked with them. <clears throat> One of them comes up to me and tells me, Dave, you know we've got to clear you first. One of the first things he said to me, I said, Sean, just do it right. But it was that attitude that they came into this situation with that I think began to take this thing off the rails. We found out later that another very well-seasoned, experienced crime scene investigator, Dr. Jim Niemeyer, I'd worked with him on cases before. He's a crime scene investigator at that point, collecting evidence. <clears throat> Told us later that after arriving on the scene, within five minutes, he had determined that this was a Dave Cam crime. Five minutes. It shows you how they were thinking, what they were thinking. Not a fingerprint had been collected. No DNA testing had been done. My alibi witness hadn't, witnesses hadn't been talked to. It was just assumed. And we know that probably percentage-wise, normally it is a spouse, a boyfriend, someone connected. But that's not always the case, and you can't make that assumption. But that's what they did. already going off the rails. They have this, these thoughts in their mind. So how do they get from there, from point A to point B, to affirm their, their beliefs at that point? Things are taken even further off the tracks at that point. The prosecutor, a man by the name of Stan Faith, I had known him also. I wouldn't say that we got along well, but we knew of each other. He arrives at the scene. There are dozens and dozens of police officers there, Indiana State Police, Sheriff's Department, New Albany City Police. But Mr. Faith makes the decision to bring in outside help. He doesn't stay within the law enforcement community in Indiana or federal. And he calls a fellow by the name of Rod Engler. <clears throat> Anyone that knows about wrongful convictions in Illinois should know something about Rod Engler. If you don't, ask us later. He calls Rod Engler. He says, Rod, I need you. You got a bad one down here. I'm gonna need your help. Rod can't make it. But he says, I'm gonna send my protege gentleman by the name of Rob Stites down to take care of his stand. Don't worry, we got this covered. And I'm paraphrasing, obviously. I can only imagine the conversation. Then 48 hours, Rob Stites arrives in Louisville. They pick him up in a limousine. He's believed to be a world-renowned expert, not only in blood stain pattern analysis, but also crime scene reconstruction. That's who the Indiana State Police believe that this man is. And I know that because they told me. World renowned. He's famous. Rob Stites is taken to the crime scene. He's basically carte blanche. Anything Rob Stites wants, he's allowed to do. He's in charge of the crime scene now. And the investigation, really. Some of the things that Mr. Stites observes that he finds suspicious that line up on a PC affidavit are, for one, I mentioned the clear liquid flowing from the blood that was around Kim. Mr. Stites makes the determination that I attempted to clean up the scene in an effort to manipulate it, to try to get away with having killed my family. He makes this based solely on his visual observations of this clear fluid. 
water and bleach added to the crime scene in an attempt to manipulate. That's what it says on the PC affidavit. For Stites to confirm his opinion, he goes into our laundry room. You know what we have in our laundry room? A bottle of bleach. That's incriminating, isn't it? But there's also, in a wash basin there, Kim had a bucket with a mop in it, in the laundry room. That was very important to them at the time. They're putting all these things together to support that belief that I had committed these crimes. They assumed that the scene had been manipulated, there was an attempt to clean it up, the bleach, the mop, the bucket were all involved in were an element of this. Mr. Stites also determines that the inside of the garage door has what's called high velocity impact spatter on the inside of it. Mr. Stites says that there's an outline of Dave standing in front of that garage door. You can see an outline of a person. It says that there's blood on the, on the inside of the garage door, therefore I would have high velocity impact spatter on me. And this would have to have been from Kim. That was critical to them. And a lot of the interviews that they did with people they would throw that out there just to try to convince them that I must be guilty for those who tried to defend me. It's a silhouette of Dave on the garage door. He had to be there. No DNA testing had been done at that point. So I'll just back up a little bit. And I'll just start with the garage door since that's where we're at. I like to work on cars. It's a hobby. You know what was on the garage door? Motor oil. And that's not just me standing here telling you that. That's from testing done by the Indiana State Police Forensic Lab. Petroleum based motor oil. That's all it was. All they had to do was ask me. I could have told them I know how I got there. It's my house. There goes the whole silhouette proposition. The clear fluid was supposed to be part of cleanup that made it to the PC affidavit. Natural phenomenon. Blood's exposed to the atmosphere. It goes through a coagulation and separation process. The red soles pull together. The clear serum separates from it what it was scientifically proven later but there were actually also experienced police officers there at the scene that knew what that was they'd seen it before in fact one went to his higher up and said this guy doesn't know what he's doing who is this guy why is he in our crime scene he was ignored Two days later, they charged me. <clears throat> Murders occurred on a Thursday evening. Sunday, they arrest me. Two and a half days. Just lost my family. I was saying I did it. Impossible position to be in, let me tell you. Back up again to the crime scene. It's a gray sweatshirt found in, in the crime scene. It's laying on the garage floor. It's a gray Hanes sweatshirt. In the beginning, that sweatshirt was important to the police. We know that because they asked a lot of questions about it. They asked me about it. Dave, did you have on a gray sweatshirt that evening? Are you sure you didn't have a gray sweatshirt on? Could you have had a gray sweatshirt on? No, 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 I don't know what you're talking about. They ask questions about this gray sweatshirt. They ask other individuals involved in the case. Family members, basketball players, could they have been wearing a gray sweatshirt? No. 
so then that great sweatshirt, as the lead investigator would later call it, became an artifact. It didn't mean anything. Even though it was foreign to the scene, it was irrelevant because it didn't fit me. State police did DNA testing on sweatshirt. Kim's blood. Brad's blood. And an unknown female contributor. Unknown. My then attorney, Michael McDaniels, who's out of New Albany, Indiana, a fairly experienced, well-respected attorney in the area. I consider Mike a friend. He's not satisfied with the testing that the, the ISP had done. So we send it to Cellmark. Mike specifically asked that the collar be tested. Let's see who was wearing that sweatshirt. We know that means something because we know it's foreign to the scene and it doesn't belong. It's the most important element of the crime scene, and it was ignored because they couldn't attach it to me. We get a profile from Selmark. Unknown male. My then attorney, Mike McDaniels, goes to the prosecutor, Stan Faith, and says, Stan, we got the results back from Selmark. I'd like you to run this through CODIS. I'm sure everyone here knows what CODIS is. Some time passes by, Stan gets hold of Mike and says, you know, we ran that DNA profile, it was nothing, it wasn't in CODIS, no hit. Now his story would change over the years as to whether or not he ran it, whether or not he asked someone else to run it, whether the ball got dropped, as he said. But at that time he told us there was no hit, nothing in CODIS. I convicted 2002. A lot of other elements in this. Elements that will be grounds for appeal. I'm going to let Stacy talk about it. It's just too hard for me. Convicted 2002, sent to the Indiana State Prison, Michigan City, Indiana. Bad place. I'm a former trooper going to the Indiana State Prison. Even worse. I'm in survival mode at this point, whatever it takes to just stay alive. I hear about this thing called an appeal. I was ignorant at that time. I didn't know that much about the process, not like I do now. My family hires attorneys to do the appeal, one of which is Miss Stacy Luana, who said, been with me 11 years. Stacy and Kitty Lyle write the appeal. We win. Direct appeal. 2004, it's reversed. Again, Stacy can talk about the elements of the appeal. Send me back to my home county. New prosecutor. We have hope. Perhaps this gentleman who I knew because he had also been with the ISP some years before he trained me in the academy in 1989. Would look at the case, evaluate it, and see it for what it is. <coughs> Dismiss the charges against me and try to find who actually killed my family. That didn't happen. Recharge me, refile charges, they're going to try me again. Second trial is upcoming. During the course of preparation leading up to the second trial, at some point in time, after we had asked them repeatedly, again, because we didn't trust the first prosecutor to have ran the DNA through CODIS, my team goes to the new prosecutor and says, look, we've got this profile. 
we don't think Stan ran this through CODIS. Can you check this? We're basically ignored. <clears throat> My uncle, who fought diligently for me for 13 and a half years, saved my life. He's talking to one of my investigators. He has a copy of the profile, and he says, will you please make sure this has been run through CODIS? At some point in time, the investigators said, in regards to the DNA profile, we don't take things from defense attorneys. So lo and behold, as one of the investigators is going through a box of material at the prosecutor's office, <coughs> he runs across the DNA profile from Selmark. They discovered it on their own. Contact the DNA analyst, ISP lab in Evansville, Indiana. Give her a copy of the profile. She runs it. It's a hit. Been in there since 1997. Three years before the murders. It was in there in 2001 when we asked for it to be ran. It wasn't ran. It had always been there. They get a hit. They go looking for the guy. 11 time convicted felon, habitual felon. Had just been released from prison about two months before my family's. He's living in Louisville, Kentucky. Career criminal, as you learn from Gary, psychopath. Very smart. Deviant but intelligent. They go pick him up. His name's Charles Bonet. <coughs> Charles, how'd you switch your get this crime scene? How'd this happen? What can you explain this to us? He says when he released, was released from prison that he took all of his prison stuff and donated it to the Salvation Army. Never been in the Cam house, never heard of Dave Cam, never met him before. Don't know anything about it. This goes on for a while. And I, we could spend hours talking about the Bonet interviews. It's lie after lie after lie after lie that they confront him with and it's changing stories. It goes on for hours, if not days. Complete denial up until the point where they, when they confront him with the fact that he left this big old fat palm print right on the side of Kim's car. He's caught now, he's there. <clears throat> so what's the story gonna be now? Oh yeah, I was there, but Dave Cam was there too. Puts it back on me. He's had five years to prepare for this time. Read every article, we know, he admits. Watched every newscast. Well versed on the ins and the outs, the minutia of the case. And I have to tell you, it's very obvious to us, it was at that time and even now looking back in hindsight, that during the course of those interviews, there was an agenda on both sides. With Bonet to save his own ass, and for the state not to have to say we were wrong about Dave. In my opinion, there was a collaborative effort to get me back in the mix so that they wouldn't have to admit that they were wrong. Because I told them from the very beginning. Boys, you got it wrong. You're expert. You better get a new one because he's not an expert. Can't be because he's wrong. So now we have the discovery of Bonet. He would eventually be arrested. They would add conspiracy to my charges and charged him with the same thing. I just mentioned expert again. Rob Stites. I have to go back to him at this point. So now we have the discovery of Bonet. 
he's charged. Well, we learned a lot of other things prior to leading up to the second trial. Rob Stice, the individual that during the course of my interrogations, they told me when I said, you're wrong, your expert's wrong, they said, again, he's world famous, Dave, he's world renowned. He didn't just start doing this yesterday, they told me. He's an expert in this field, they said. I said, boys, I don't care, you're wrong, your expert's wrong. Well, here's what we found out about Rob Stites prior to the second trial. Never had a single hour's training in bloodstain pattern analysis. Not one. Never attended a class. But represented himself as an expert. The prosecutor represented him as an expert. Had never been to a crime scene before. We didn't do anything other than guard it as a uniformed police officer. He had never processed a crime scene before. Yet he represented himself during the first trial as crime scene reconstructions. He wasn't. He was a fraud. He said that he was studying to get his PhD in fluid dynamics during the first trial. Had never had a single hour's class in fluid dynamics. All lies. Second trial. And I'll speed up here, Bill. Second trial, second conviction. Second reversal. Third trial. Stacy's still on the case. Rick came and comes in. New judge in northern part of Indiana. New experts, scientists. We had scientists on our side this time. Because I'm here to tell you, bloodstain pattern analysis, there's nothing scientific about that. We proved in my case, it's 50-50. Sometimes experts agree, sometimes they don't. They work on this case together, in that case they don't. They charge three, $400 an hour. We have a great team, we're unified, we go into the third trial. The jury was out hours, not days. And in fact, they said later we had a meeting with them. They could have come back the first day within 30 minutes. It was that obvious to them. And Bonet testified in that third trial. That was the difference. Before I wrap up the third trial, I just want to tell you one thing about Bonet. <coughs> something that we learned in visiting with the jurors who sat in on that third trial. He's sitting on the stand testifying and I'm over here with the attorneys. Bonet is looking at, at me and we're having these staring issues and it's very uncomfortable to say the least. There's police officers surrounding both of us. And Bonet is sitting there looking at me and this was witnessed by the jurors, not us, holding his hand like a gun, pointing it at me and he would go, one, two, three. One, two, three. Kim Brad Jill. And he did that during the course of his testimony. The, the jurors saw him. It wasn't hard for them. Not guilty. Times three. been just over seven months. I guess I would just say to sum this thing up is, you know, I don't know what you all do exactly or who you are or whatever. I know you're in the legal field and so on. And I have told students this before that I've told this story to you. I don't care who you are or what you do. Or I don't, you know, with young people at the colleges, if they want to go into law enforcement, they want to be police officers, I don't care. That's fine. But whatever you do, be fair. 
Just be fair. Treat people the way that you would want to be treated if you were in that situation. Because you know what? Sometimes you're going to have an innocent person sitting there. It's going to happen. Recognize that. Be diligent in your defense. We're all human beings and we all make mistakes, including police officers, including prosecutors and judges. And when you're wrong, if that happens, have the courage to recognize it and do the right thing and make it right. As human beings, we owe that to each other. Thank you. Let me uh, introduce the next phase of this program, and that's uh, hearing from the uh, defense team. Stacy Williana, who represented David in both the appeals and uh, two appeals, and uh, her investigator, Gary Dunn. Stacy and Gary. We'll, we'll try and uh, compress this. Uh, as, as Bill said, I spent 27 years with the FBI, uh, including uh, 15 years in Chicago and Gary, Indiana. So I've had some experience, uh, a depth of experience, with, with dealing with people who obviously uh, have some uh, uh, issues when it comes to obeying the law. I, I've, I've, I've conducted literally thousands of interviews over the years. Uh, and most of which were in the, the criminal uh, arena. In that regard, um, I, I often said that after I retired from the FBI, I, I had this crazy idea that uh, the, uh, the turmoil and the mayhem and the murder would be over with, and it wasn't. Because I answered the phone one day and it was her counterpart, Kitty, saying, hey, listen, we got this innocent guy. And I said, yeah, right, you know. <laughs> but, but anyway, I've often said it's the worst damn thing I've ever done in my life, and I thank God I did it, um, because this was a cause. Having said that, early on it became apparent to me that this investigation was horribly, horribly askew. There, there's no way that it, a, a thinking person could have seen what I saw could have heard what they heard and not come to the same conclusion, this thing is really screwed up. And, and I, I, I was as independent as I could because the first time I sat down with David at the Floyd County Jail, I said, hey Dave, I said, I'm just going to follow the evidence. I said, if it cuts for you, that's fine. If it doesn't, you know, it sucks to be you. Th those were my words. But by God, I tell you, he was an innocent man. And this became a passion. And then the, the, the gall of the, the prosecutors and the police, and let me tell you something, I work very closely with the Indiana State Police on several murder investigations. I have a great number of friends, but the people, I'm wound up now, see, the people <laughs> involved in this investigation, they, it was one of those ready, fire, aim. They had their man. Jim Neymar, the guy I worked with on, on a series of uh, homicides in Greene County, he, he, uh, Dave is right. He gets to the crime scene, looks outside of it, doesn't even enter it, and said, this is Dave Cam's crime. Jill's pants were off, for God's sakes. I mean, and, and they discount a possible sexual assault? I mean, you know, wh where are they? Wh wh what's going on here? But anyway, we demand, and Stacy and Kitty, January 26, 2005, I remember it well. They said, hey, listen, we're going to file a motion to compel for you people to run that DNA. And finally he did, under that threat of a motion to compel, and voila, here we have Charles Bonet. Later, of course, they claim, hey, we did this, we solved the case. They were made to do it. And then over a period of two weeks, they interviewed Charles Bonet for at least 45 hours. And that's not included. Ten telephone calls we later discover where no record was made. 
at least a two-hour sit down with him in the Floyd County Prosecutor's Office of which, office of which no record was made. They tell him what's going on and to, to look at the surviving records of the interviews, it's, it, it's the three of them are working together. They, they asked Charles Bonet, for example, Charles, is it possible that you gave, a Dave, gave Dave Cam a untraceable gun, you know, a dirty gun, wrapped in your sweatshirt? No. Well, later after the palm prints match, his written statement, I gave David Cam an untraceable gun wrapped in my sweatshirt. You think that's a clue? I sit down and I talk with Charles Bonet for about three hours. He was audacious enough that he's going to convince me of his innocence. Within the first 20 minutes, he tells me 12 lines. 12. Now, you know, listen, I, I, I'm, I'm not the ace investigator, but I recognize a clue when I hear one, you know? 12 lines. And he's, he's lying in front of the same investigator that's coaching him to tell this other story. It, it's, it's beyond insane. But let me tell you this, what's, what's even worse, when we first found out about this DNA, February 25th, 2005, I'm in Kitty's office with Stacy, and we are high-fiving, Lord, praise of God, you know, this is wonderful. I find out, we're doing a little bit of background on this guy, and it turns out, of course, New Albany's my hometown, as it turns out, so I know the town well. And I know where he's living, is four houses down from Dave's uncle. And also uh, about a quarter mile from where Dave's sister-in-law and her husband have a meat market where this guy shops. Clearly, their paths, Kim and Charles Bonet's probably intersected. And we know that this guy had previously stalked other women. We just find this out in three hours. I call the investigator and I said, Gary, listen, you gotta know this. Charles Bonet lives right here and this is what he's done and, and, and this is, you know, the DNA, like that's a clue with his the, the uh, nickname, Backbone on the inside of the collar, which was his prison nickname. Gary Gilbert says, doesn't matter. I go, and I, that's what I said, I said, what the f*** are you talking about? <laughs> he goes, it doesn't matter. I said, how can it not matter? He said, the blood stain is compelling. I will never forget that. Blood stain is compelling in Trump's DNA. And then it got worse as the prosecutors continued to lie, to cheat, and to do everything they could to make sure that innocent man stayed in prison. I don't know how much time we have left or if you want... Okay. Well, I don't even know if I have 15 minutes. I can even take your guys' questions if you want, but... Um, you know, all I can say to lawyers is perseverance. You know, I got in the case 11 years ago, 12 years ago, and um, as I told Dave, I was younger and hotter, and, but he took a toll on me. But <laughs> and we had our ups and downs, you know. I mean, we got the first case uh, reversed when his family came to me and they said, you know, look, he has 11 basketball players, and that's one thing, you know, nobody's really talked about. 11 guys have stood up in court repeatedly and said, he was with me. He never left the gym. He never came back into the gym. He didn't act abnormal. No one said, hey, where's Dave? No one saw blood on him. And these are 11 stand-up guys, and um, they've been treated like criminals. You know, they were lied to. They were manipulated. They were treated like accomplices, and they've been through the ringer. But they kept coming back, trial after trial, saying, no, he was with me. So Dave's family comes to me and says, we got these 11 guys who say Dave was with them. I'm like, okay. And the, what the prosecution did was said that he snuck out of a basketball game. So what they say is that he was playing basketball. They don't claim that he wasn't playing basketball. He got in his car, drove home, killed his family, came back to the game and no one noticed and he never acted any differently and no one saw the blood on him and what they did in the first trial to sell that story is that they attacked him they went back into 10 years of his life talked to every friend every woman every co-worker he's ever had and came up with any dirty story they could find 
and the whole trial was about manipulating the jury into believing he was of a very bad character. And they brought in 10 different women to say that Dave went from anywhere from having an affair to just talking with them and flirting with them. It was a parade and it was a circus. And when the family came to me and told me this, my first reaction is, you know, I've heard a little bit about this case, but you're, there's something you're not telling me. But, you know, we'll look at it. And when I read that two month trial, it was exactly what they said, and even worse. So we went to the Court of Appeals, and um, the, it only took them like three months to come down with that reading at, you know, 10,000 pages of uh, case in these huge briefs, oversized briefs. Three months, one of the mo most brutal decisions I've ever seen on a state's case. It was so brutal, they like dropped a footnote on me and it basically inferred I should have argued sufficiency, which that's always nice, you know? You win one and they're like, but you should have, you should have done this. So I did ask for a sufficiency review to the Indiana Supreme Court, but they ignored it. So anyways, we went back and it was such a brutal decision that the court let Dave out on bond. And in Indiana, you do not get bond on murder unless it, the state's case is weak. And the defense had to prove the state's case was weak. And the judge looked at that opinion and he said, the Court of Appeals has already said the state's case is weak. So they let him out on bond. And we thought this was going to be easy. This is going to be great. You know, we don't have the character assassination. We have the 11 basketball players. We're golden. And that's when they uh, finally ran the DNA and they found Charles Bonet. And instead of letting Dave go free, they dismissed the case in the venue county refiled it, added a conspiracy charge back in the county with all the prejudice and went to Dave's work and arrested him in front of his family. And he went back to prison, or back to jail, awaiting trial. No more bond, because guess what? We have an eyewitness now. So the case got stronger, according to that. So we went and we fought it. And this time, and I'll make it just a little, try to make it brief, they can't use the women. They can't turn them into this uh, monster through the uh, serial adultery or whatever they wanted to say. So they had to think of something else. And this time they went with molestation. They said, okay, maybe Dave wasn't cheating on his wife, because he wasn't at the time. A lot of this was exaggerated. It was 10 years earlier. Um, but he molested his daughter. But there was absolutely no evidence of it. In fact, the evidence that day was that his daughter was perfectly happy. She went to dance class. She went to school. She ran up and down the bleachers at her brother's uh, swim practice. There was no sign of any type of trauma or anything going on in that family. But yet the whole second trial was about this dark, sinister secret that didn't even exist. And they even went so far to speculate that Jill was being molested. She told her mom. Her mom was going to leave Dave. Dave found this out, came home and killed them all. But that day, Kim, this wonderful mother by all accounts, didn't call the doctor, didn't call the school, didn't pack any bags. She made a dentist appointment for Jill. What mother who finds out her child's being molested makes a dentist appointment for her? But that didn't stop the judge. He allowed him to go full force. He even allowed an expert to get on the stand and say that this was molest and it would have been so painful and that the person that the little girl would have told would have been her mom. And it was all pure speculation. So when we lost, we talked to the jury. Well, and the jury told the media. They had an interview with the media. And they told the media that they came to their conclusion because they believed Dave molested his daughter. So we attached that to a motion to correct errors, got it in the record, and did an appeal. And the Supreme Court asked the prosecutor on appeal in oral argument, what evidence do you have that Dave molested his daughter? He started flipping through his stuff, looking down. <laughs> I'll be right with you. <laughs> it went on like this for a little bit, and I tried to not smile, look down, keep your composure. Finally, he said, I can't tell you right now. I, I, don't, I don't have anything for you. Because they had nothing. So we got the case reversed again, which is pretty unheard of in Indiana to get a triple murder, two month trial reversed twice. So we went back, third time, 
the only motive they're left with this time? Insurance. It's money. It's money this time. He killed his family for $400,000. In the trial, at some points, you just had to laugh. I mean, they put into evidence as a part of a motive for murder is that in 2032, Dave would get a part of Kim's pension. So he killed his wife in 2000. So in 2032, he would be set when he can retire. And um, it went a lot better <laughs> this time around. And when the jury saw Charles Bonet on the stand, they heard his lies, they saw his games. I think at that point it was over. They knew who killed Dave's family. And the basketball players, they loved him. <laughs> they held their own. It took them three trials to learn how to defend themselves on cross. But they learned how. And uh, they wouldn't take the prosecutor's cross this time. And they ended up doing a wonderful job. And the jury said you can't be in two places at one time. So it's perseverance. You know, there were hard times. I, I almost quit <laughs> after we won the second appeal and, you know, let new attorneys completely take over for Dave because it's kind of hard to do it again, to see those same people you crossed before and do it all over again and to look at what mistakes you made that second time and to fix them. And it was worth it, and I'm, I'm glad I did it. So if you guys have a case you believe in, don't give up. Keep fighting, because in the end, you may just win. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation form to provide gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois.